good morning everyone my name is michelle i hope you're doing well and this is episode five of crime story sunday my weekly series where i look at a different historical case each week and we do a deep dive on it so last week i took you to 19th century chicago to the lair of serial killer hh H. holmes a very dark story like some of the details just sound like they come from a horror movie but this week i want to take us much closer to home time wise we've got less far to travel if we had the time machine to take us backwards but over the other side of the world for me in new south wales australia and this is the case of the mysterious the strange the baffling disappearance of little three-year-old William Tyrrell. I've decided to do this case this week because there is a lot of renewed interest in it because there's been new developments. So we're gonna get into all of that and uh, we're gonna bring this case bang up to date. You know, I was surprised how many people had never heard of the William Tyrrell case when I I talked about it um, earlier this week in a video over on my bigger channel, Michelle After Dark. I think you're going to be really interested in this one, so let's get into it. So William Tyrrell, who was born on the 26th of June 2011, was three years old when he disappeared from his foster grandmother's home in Kendall, a very small town in New South Wales, Australia, a very rural area. They lived in a nice home on Benaroon Drive in Kendall. And William disappeared on the 12th of September 2014. So he was dressed in the Spider-Man costume that he loved. And that Spider-Man costume is just so William. It's it's become iconic to the case. And it's one of the things that I think everybody remembers about William Tyrrell. Just this cute little boy dressed up as Spider-Man. So he'd been playing with his sister um, around the, the, the foster grandmother's home. And the foster mother heard him. And then she didn't. And that was it. According to her story, William Tyrrell just just vanished. Poof. Just seemingly vaporised. So today, in episode five of Crime Story Sunday, we are going to investigate the strangeness of the disappearance. We're going to explore the suspects. We're going to explore the police investigation. And then, as I said, we are going to bring this case back up to date. Now, up until November the 15th, when things started to come out, like November the 15th this year, it had always been kind of the theory that the police had worked on was one of an abduction. But on 15th of November, after receiving new evidence, and I'd love to know what the details of that new evidence is, but I can't find that that's been released anywhere. New South Wales Police renewed the search for William Tyrrell in three specific areas surrounding Kendall. They're searching for human remains. On the 17th of November, the media reported that William Tyrrell's foster mother is now their person of interest. All eyes are now on her and the foster grandmother, but she's now passed away. So the heat is on for the foster mother. And they're now working from the premise that William might have had a tragic accident that has been covered up. Listen to the 911 call. This is just part of the 911 call that William's foster mother uh, gave on that day. Police emergency, this is the nine. Yeah, hi, my son is missing. He's three and a half. Okay. Um, sorry? What's your address? Uh, 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 48 Benaroon Drive, yep. Kendall. Okay, 48 Benaroon Drive in Kendall. Yes. All right, I'm just going to bring that up on my map. It won't be a moment. Thank you. How long has he been missing? I th- well, I think, well, we've been looking in for him now for about 15 or 20 minutes, but okay. I thought it could be five, it could be longer, because he's just playing around here. We heard him, and then we heard nothing. Okay, so he's been missing since about 10.30? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, can you describe him to me? How tall? Obviously not very tall. No, but he's, he'd, be, he... he'd be about two and a half feet. He's wearing a Spider-Man outfit. Yep. 
What kind um, of hair has he got? He's got um, dark sandy coloured hair, it's short, and he's got really big uh, browny green coloured eyes. Do you get any shoes on? Do you know any, any other distinguishing features? Um, 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 he has... Oh, he's got a freckle on the top of his head when you part the hair on the left-hand side. Yeah. You'll see a freckle on the top of his head. Okay. All right. Do you know where he might have gone? Um, we're, we actually live... Well, London's property is near a state forest. Okay. And they're on huge blocks. We've walked up and down Benaroon Drive and we can't find him. Okay, what's his name? William. Let's take us back to that day, the 12th of September, 2014. Actually, we'll go back to the 11th and we'll say that three-year-old William Tyrrell, who lived with his foster parents and his five-year-old sister, travelled four hours from Sydney, from their home in Sydney, to visit his foster mother's mother, so William's foster grandmother. I'm sorry I have to keep saying foster mother and foster grandmother because the names have been released. This is because this is, um, he was in the care of the state, he was in the foster care system. By law, the names can't be released of his foster family or his biological family. So it's a bit of a tongue twist to keep saying foster grandmother, but that's, that's the way we have to play it, I'm afraid. So his foster grandmother, as I said, lives in a nice property on Benaroon Drive in Kendall. Now, this is very rural and it's directly across from kind of brushland, woodland. It's easy to imagine William getting overexcited and running off into the woodland and just getting picked up by a nasty stranger. So it was at 9.37 on the 12th of September that William's foster mother took those iconic photographs of William in his Spider-Man costume. They just saw William. He's such a cute, gorgeous little boy. Now, between 10 and 10.25, she can't give a specific to the minute timescale on this because William's foster mother and foster grandmother were kind of chilling out around the house you know, just, just chilling out, chatting. It was a nice morning. And there was, you know, all was well. All was well with the world. William's foster mother claims that he and his sister, then age five, were playing hide and seek around the property. So they were running in the front and the backyard, but it was perfectly safe. It was set away from the road. And, you know, little kids want to go and you know, burn up some energy and, and go and play outside, right, for some exercise. So they were sitting outside watching them for a period of time and then allegedly his foster mother went inside to make a cup of tea. He'd been playing tigers whilst playing hide and seek, so he was pretending to be like this big tiger. <laughs> so a tiger dressed in a Spider-Man costume. It's just so, it's just so damn cute. He was going, rah, 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 rah. So she could hear these rah, 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 rahs. And then it just befell her that it was all quiet. And you know when kids go quiet, you know yourself if you've, if you've had little kids. If kids go quiet, you know there's a problem. And you go and check it out. And his foster mother's last memory was William doing those tiger roarings round kind of the side of the home. Like I said, they were running like forwards and backwards to the front yard, backyard. You know, just uh, an innocent game of hide and seek and game of tigers, dressed as little Spider-Man. And, the, and the, this, is, this is her words. This is what she said. I heard a roar. It sounded really loud and close, like he was just around the corner. After a couple of minutes, I thought, oh, he's gone quiet. It was only a matter of a few minutes. I don't understand how he could disappear so quickly. So William's foster father was with them on the trip, but he'd gone into, into town to get better uh, cell reception because this was, you know, he started out in, you know, the rural areas. So he had left the home about 9.30, no problems whatsoever, to drive out of Kendall to get better mobile receptions for a a Skype call he needed to do for work. And this has all been verified by the police. All of this has been checked out by the police. You know, he's got alibis. 
he was actually seen at a chemist picking up a prescription so we know where he was and he was not in the home so he's not in the frame for this at all the police have, have verified that but by the time he arrived back you know around maybe he was out an hour maybe a little bit more by the time the foster father got home she'd already searched the house the garden uh, she'd taken her mother's car and driven kind of up and down Benaroon, Benaroon Road, Benaroon Drive, and in the immediate vicinity. But she thought that he couldn't have got that far because he'd only been missing. He's only a little three-year-old. He only turned three in, in June, and this is September. So she was working on the premise that he couldn't have got far. So she drove up and down Benaroon just to see if she could see him, and, and she couldn't. So once William's foster father arrived home, he went door to door, knocking on neighbours' doors. So they tried their best to find him. This is the story that they've stuck with. They've stuck with this story constantly. They haven't wavered. I've seen interviews with them and, and they haven't wavered. So it was at 10.56 when the foster mother made that call. Uh, to triple zero. So triple zero is the emergency service number. In America, it's 911. Over here in the UK, it's 999. Uh, and the police started to arrive at 11.06. It only took them 10 minutes to arrive. So all of this started to unfold very quickly. So there was hundreds of police, members of the state emergency services, the fire service, members of the community, you know, the neighbours that had been alerted to this. They came out looking, they searched their properties. This was a really, really big search. So specialist police were also alerted to the fact that there's this missing, missing child under these really strange circumstances that one minute he was there and the next he wasn't. So they suspected an abduction. Their theory of abduction has stuck with this case and possibly marred this case because it's been blinkered it's been single-minded on the abduction theory for seven years but specialist police were alerted including sex crime squad motorcycles helicopters just everything all pulling out all the stops to find william plus this kind of you know the beginnings of this desk operation to search out all the the sex offenders in the area Right, so this was a big deal. And this has become one of the biggest searches in Australian history. This was huge. So there's hundreds of people searched all day and all night. They searched overnight through this rugged terrain, through the bushland, you know, avoiding snakes and spiders and you know, at risk to themselves, but they were they were searching everywhere. They called the divers in to look at, you know, water sources. They had search dogs in the woods around the property and the search dogs only alerted to William's scent. These were search dogs that were searching for William's scent on the property. The search dogs found William's scent straight away on the property, but it just left. It absolutely seemed like he was taken. You know, the, the search dogs tracked him to the, the driveway, to the front yard, around the backyard, but he did not leave this property, according to these search dogs. The police really then started to, you know, do that, that desk investigation, you know, gather intelligence as to who was living in the area. One of the first reports was two cars that were seen around the Benaroon Drive area. One was parked actually in the street. And bear in mind, Benaroon Drive is very rural. It's a dead end. You know, it wasn't a through fare. So these cars were kind of remembered. One of them was described as a white station wagon. And the other one was kind of an older style gray vehicle. And that gray one was parked between two driveways of an acre of, of land that was kind of one lot further down the road so the police started to pull out all the stops to find the drivers of these two vehicles and strangely reports claim that these 
there was guys in these vehicles and they were seen with their windows down as if they were watching, waiting, looking for an opportunity maybe. And they were noticed, these two vehicles were noticed by William's mother, foster mother, sorry, when she went out looking for William. She reports seeing these two mysterious vehicles. Nothing came of that. So after five days, they scaled down the ground search. They just exhausted all of the possibilities of where William could have gone and run away, got himself into trouble, had an accident in the woods, been eaten, you know, killed by an animal even. So this desk operation kind of took over, I guess. So on the 16th of September, 2014, Strike Force Roseanne was put into play. It was established, this special network, this special strike force to investigate William's case. And Strike Force Roseanne is still in operation. So this initially consisted of 14 detectives and police analysts, like combing through all the data, everything that they were amassing, intelligence gathering behind the scenes. They sifted through hundreds of pieces of information. Like tips were just pouring in. The amount of intelligence they gathered was immense. But yet, there was no cracks in this case. None. The chief of these operations, Gary Jubilin, who has, has kind of like become the face of this statewide investigation, the head of Strike Force Roseanne. He was one of the highest profile homicide detectives. He would play hardball. He would get answers. So William's foster family were pleased at uh, Gary Jubilin's handling of this abduction. His career, though, as we'll see, started to unravel because of this case. If we come a little bit forward now, it wasn't just weeks passing by or months passing by, it was years passing by. And over the years, police have interviewed more than a 1,000 people in connection with this case, you know, based on tips that have come in, based on following up lines of intelligence behind the scenes. So you can't say that they've, they've not put the work in. They, they absolutely have, but they've been working off this premise that William was abducted. And I think that's one of the major downfalls of all of this work. They were, they were blinkered, they were, fought, they, were, they were walking down one route. And that can be a problem with any missing persons investigation. You've got to keep an open mind. If you, if you remain blinkered, then, yeah, you find lots and lots and lots of evidence. But it doesn't lead you anywhere because you, you're barking up the wrong theory, so to speak. So, allegedly, they've searched 11,000 documents that were created by this police intelligence. And the search has gone global. It's well known in Europe. And I was surprised, actually, that that some of you guys have never heard of this one. Crime Stoppers websites in 26 countries have been asked by the Australian Federal Police to create appeals for William's safe return. But the police, headed up by Gary Jubilin, they kind of set the bar really low to be called a person of interest. And this was one of Gary Jubilin's strategy, that he'd create all these persons of interest and then send out teams to investigate each one. So although a lot of work went into it, in my opinion, in creating this really low bar and just calling everybody a person of interest, that actually becomes a problem because you're wasting a lot of time and you're wasting a lot of resources. But that's just in, in my opinion. Allegedly, they amassed almost 700 persons of interest over the years. But really, honestly, had they really got anything to do with it? Wasn't this just a waste of resources? You know, if they'd maybe set the bar a little higher, they could have been a little bit more concentrated, a little bit less blinkered. I, I don't know. That's just my opinion. So on the second anniversary of William's disappearance, the New South Wales government announced a $1 million reward for information on his whereabouts. But even that incentive, you know, tips continue to come in this low bar of this establishment of persons of interest all carried on two years, went into three years, went into four years, and William is still missing. But some of these tips, you know, were, were really quite credible, to be honest. I'll just give you a couple of examples. 
So there was one of a photograph taken of a man and a young boy in Queensland, Australia, who looked strikingly similar to William. But he's just a cute little three-year-old boy, kind of like, um, you know, mousy brown hair, just, just this cute, radiant smile. And uh, it's easy to mistake him, I guess, for other kids. So this one in Queensland, you know, it was checked out. It was verified that it wasn't William. In early 2015, uh, two passengers and a member of the crew in one New Zealand bound flight thought they saw William on one of the planes. The police actually met the aircraft at the, you know, at its landing spot. They were there waiting. So they established very quickly that this wasn't William. Another photo came to the police showing a young boy and a woman at a McDonald's restaurant in central Queensland. So the, the search actually, you know, moved quite, quite quickly to Queensland. You know, they were expecting that Queensland was possibly one of the places it'd been taken, you know, been taken out of state. So the strike force, strike force Roseanne, quickly cleared the parents of any involvement, the foster, the foster family of any involvement, which potentially was a mistake. Although Gary Jubilin has come on record, um, you know, this week, actually, and said, look, I interrogated, my team interrogated them. We, we ambushed them. We took them by surprise. They even bugged their car, unbeknownst to the foster parents, and um, um, allegedly nothing. They've always stuck to the same story, to the same script. They've stuck absolutely to the script. They have never wavered, even under interrogation. So they were cleared. There's no evidence against them, allegedly. If you clear the foster family, the only other explanation was an abduction, was an opportunistic abduction. It couldn't have been a planned abduction, or at least not planned for very long, because William was just visiting. He didn't live there. He lived in Sydney four hours away. So that was the only thing that made sense. And I guess if once you've cleared the family, the only thing, you know, abduction is the only thing that does make sense. They started to think, is this a paedophile ring? You know, they, they went back to think about these two guys sat around Benaroon. You know, one of them in a white vehicle, one of them in a grey vehicle. Were they involved? That was a big question mark. The police believe William could actually be alive and, and being held, you know, being trafficked and being held by members of this paedophile ring. You know, trafficking, child trafficking goes on all over the world. So it's a perfectly logical theory to have and to work from. But after extensive investigations, that was actually ruled out. That, you know, they, they explored all the sex offenders, they explored all those kind of links to no avail. They discounted paedophile ring, so they, they, but they carried on going with this was just an opportunistic stranger who saw William perhaps in, in the front yard, lured him down, down the drive and, you know, hi Spider-Man, you know, you know, make a deal of this Spider-Man costume and play with him a little bit. But it had to have been done so fast because his foster mother said it was literally minutes. She, he was doing this rah, 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 rah. He went quiet and then suddenly he was gone. Then they started to think, well, is it somebody who did have access to the property, maybe saw William? Hmm. And this is where we bring in Bill Spedding, who absolutely has just become the fall guy in this investigation. It's, it's horrific what happened. And he had a, a washing machine repair business and he'd repaired a washing machine at William's foster grandmother's home and he just became number one suspect. You know, they, they were having all of these persons of interest, but he was number one. Right? He was number one in Gary Jubilin's mind. And Gary Jubilin played hardball to try to get a confession out of Bill Spedding to crack this case. You know, Gary Jubilin wanted to diss on his record. This would have been a big career achievement for him if he'd led up this task force, this strike force, that found the abductor. There's a four corners 
episode. I'll leave a link to it in the description box because it's really interesting. It's all about the investigation of Bill Spedding and what happened to him. I can only give you an overview in this video, but it's, it's both fascinating and horrifying what happened to Bill. So he had alibis, multiple alibis. There was digital evidence that proved where he was on the 12th of September, around the time William disappeared. On the 12th of September, he spent some time at the office, kind of the first hour of his working day was at his office. Like, you know, I don't know, dealing with cars, dealing with paperwork, bills, etc. And then he came out of the office and he met his wife for coffee across the road from the school that Bill Spedding's grand, grandson, I think it was his grandson, one of his grandkids anyway, was um, getting an award. And Bill and his wife went to the school to watch this awards assembly. So the entire school <laughs> who was at that awards assembly could verify where Bill was at the time William disappeared. It's insane to have even considered this guy the number one suspect, but unfortunately, he really was. Despite all of this, thousands and thousands of inquiries, despite the almost 700 persons of interest, they had this number one suspect, so blinkered were they, they had this number one suspect and they just tried to get him to crack. And they didn't follow up on all of these alibis. After this, this school assembly, Bill left um, to do a job, to go and, you know, repair someone's washing machine and this call this service was at the opposite side of the town he lived in so he lived just outside of Kendall he left the school people saw him leave and he went in the opposite direction to Kendall he was nowhere near Kendall he had repaired their washing machine days before but he was not there. He was not there and could prove he wasn't there on the morning of the 12th of September. So his wife went home to, they lived in Loriton, and she went home and, and they just, both of them went on with the day. But then this just took a dramatic turn for Bill. A few days after William's disappearance, the police swarmed in droves to Bill Spedding's property. So they let the police in, they had nothing to hide. They just thought, well, you know, we're helping with this investigation. They didn't live in Kendall, but they lived nearby and they had that, Bill had that kind of loose connection. So it was understandable that they'd want to check him out. So they didn't think anything of it. They let them in, let them search. And they, they absolutely, they had the warrants and stuff, but they ripped the home apart. They latched on to the fact that Bill had this accusation against him which had been dismissed regarding some kind of child sex thing but it had been dismissed he was not found guilty of anything but I guess the police were able to put two and two together and and just try to make it add up to four despite the fact that Bill had alibis so they searched his property with a fine tooth comb and they found a Spider-Man toy in Bill's work van. And Bill says himself that his work van, he never cleaned it out, he never tidied it out. You know, he was a busy man. And this Spider-Man toy had belonged to his grandson when his grandson was a little boy, a little tiny boy. And this was actually verified by Bill's grandson that this was his toy. <laughs> you know, what's that still doing there kind of thing? You know, come on, granddad, you never clean your van out. You know, you can imagine the conversation, can't you? So they used that, they latched onto that. There's hours and hours of footage of Bill Spedding being interviewed by the police. You know, playing real hardball, quite honestly. And they had, they had nothing to go off. They really hadn't. And this ruined Bill's life. It ruined his business. It created a huge amount of stress. Can you imagine being accused based on what, that you repaired the washing machine at the home days before? And a Spider-Man toy? And nothing else? No other evidence against you? Can you imagine what that must feel like? It just ruined his life. You know, there was people shouting obscenities to him. And, you know, just horrific. This man was innocent. 
you know, and they were saying, oh, he's just this creepy pervert who, you know, he should have been arrested years ago, blah, 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 blah. No, <laughs> no, that's not how police investigations should work. Gary Jubilin was playing hardball to get a conviction and he didn't, he didn't care if this guy didn't do it, in my opinion. He just wanted someone to confess, to make him and his team look good. That, that is just my opinion, but it, it makes me angry when, when things like this happen. It really does. They had his diary. They took his phone. They could have tracked his movements. They could have been to the school. And he paid for the coffee before they went to the school assembly with his card, his credit card. So that was proof. He was there at the coffee shop just before 10.30 before they walked over the road to the, the school assembly. But they failed to trace any alibis. They failed to follow up. It's just crazy. It really is crazy. But he sued uh, New South Wales Police. He sued them and he won. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's exonerated him, but it's wrecked his life whilst all of this was going on. So he got compensation from New South Wales courts um, for reputational damage. The judge said this was, you know, this was just malicious. There was no case to answer. And he took Bill's side. <sighs> so let's bring us up to date. Well, just this week, as I said in the intro, the 15th of November, things just really started to happen. I mean, there has been searches, renewed searches over the years, like there was one in 2018, but nothing like this. This has taken a dramatic twist. Police have been seen, you know, digging, digging up the, the property of the foster grandmother's home and some areas around Kendall. So they obviously have some intelligence from somewhere that, um, you know, maybe something other than a stranger abduction went down here. You know, the, obviously the camera crews are all there and not, they've kind of seen this blue pieces of material that look like possibly they came from a Spider-Man outfit, you know, being rushed into the forensic kind of tent and, and taken away for, for testing. Um, they've been comparing pictures of Spider-Man costumes with these kind of scraps of material that have been found around a creek in the woods in Kendall. So we'll, we'll see what, what comes of that. So this dig site borders Beta, Barter Creek Road. If you remember, foster mother went, took grandmother's vehicle and went searching down Benaroon and just around the immediate vicinity. So they're following that route and they have even seized that vehicle. They've tracked that vehicle down. They mean business. They've tracked that vehicle down and it was 400 kilometres away because it had been sold. Grandmother's dead now. It's been sold. Just like some kind of regular family bought this vehicle. But that's been seized for forensic testing. You know, they've, they've done luminol uh, uh, around the area of the balcony, in the car. The, they've got the dogs back. You know, they, they, it's almost like they've completely changed their mind on the theory. It's like they've almost completely moved away from a stranger abduction and they've gone into the family and the immediate vicinity perhaps exactly what they should have done from day one although they did they did extensive searches but because the foster family had been ruled out then you know it was considered not relevant to to carry on searching have they been barking up the wrong tree all of this time. So William's biological family, where are they? Because William was in foster care. Now they can't be named for legal reasons, but this has wrecked their lives as well. The biological grandmother never believed the, that the investigation was going in the right direction. But Gary Jubilin had dismissed that because he said, you know, I've, I've interrogated the parents they have nothing to do with this. I've checked it all out. They have nothing to do with this. You know, I suppose they kind of think if this, coming, if this criticism's coming from the biological family, well, it's just sour grapes. You know, they maybe just want William back 
Who knows? But William's biological grandmother has now spoken out. She's opened up about the shambolic police investigation. You know, some choice words that she's given, that she's actually given over the years, to be honest. How botched this investigation was. And, and I think it proves it. I think the, the Bill Spedding debacle absolutely proves that these police investigations, despite all this work and manpower that went into it, they've been barking up the wrong theory all along. That's what it looks like now. You know, the, the biological grandmother, her disdain of this entire thing has been focused around Gary Jubilin, Gary Jubilin himself. And interestingly, he was removed in 2019 because he'd been found guilty of illegally recording a potential suspect. <laughs> so he was playing hardball. He didn't care what he had to do. This is breaching everything that should be holy in police investigations. Because if you get, get it wrong, if you get information falsely or illegally, that's not admissible in court. So it potentially prejudices any further investigation that could lead to trial. It's really bad, really bad. But the biological grandmother has spoken out and she's panicking now at the thought of William actually being found like on or around that property. And he's just been lying there all of this time. And she's worried about what it's going to do to her son, William's biological father. And it's understood, this, I got this kind of from the media, it's understood that William's biological father is now homeless and, and he's not been kept abreast with what's been going on. He's learning about these new developments allegedly from social media. The backstory, all of these different aspects just demonstrate how a botched police investigation absolutely can ruin lives. So these are the biological grandmother's words. Look at what this has done to me. Look at what this has done to my son. The foster care people, they knew everything and we knew nothing. A few days ago, Gary Jubilin, there's nothing to do with him now, but he went on Sydney radio saying that the, de the decision of the new task force, like these renewed efforts to search the property, he says is unusual. I would argue they're going back to the beginning and perhaps following lines of inquiry that were shut down too prematurely. That's just my opinion. The police commissioner, Mick Fuller, who's now heading up this task force, said um, he struck back and said, I inherited what was a bit of a mess. <laughs> make of that what you will. It's not for the want of the people working on it. They've worked really, really hard. But because they've barked up the wrong theory and just stuck to it and not explored in the same level of depth other possibilities, this is just really, really bad police work, quite honestly, in my opinion. So in February 2019, that was when uh, Gary Jubilin was removed after this... Um, these allegations of misconduct, which he was later found guilty of. March the 25th, an inquest into William Turrell's disappearance began and some information that was previously not known to the public became known because the results of, a, of an inquest becomes, it becomes part of public record. Gary Jubilin was just botching, botching this investigation. The biological father was reported saying in 2019 authorities effed up. The minister had a duty of care to keep William safe until he was 18. That was not the case at all. So he's arguing that they've placed him with an unsafe family. Now, whether that's founded or not remains to be seen. William's foster mother is now their chief person of interest. And they're perhaps now going to dot the I's and cross all the T's and follow those lines of inquiry, which, in my opinion, were just done half-heartedly. You know, Gary Jubilin saying, well, they interrogated the foster parents. Well, did you, though? <laughs> did you, though? How, how well did you do that? Or did you just prefer to, you know, try to get a conviction out of someone that you deemed to be an easy target? You know, i.e. Bill Spedding, 
who allegations have been made against him about inappropriateness with children. So yeah, he's a potential target. Oh, look, we found a Spider-Man toy. That proves it. That must be awful. Little William still lies missing somewhere. This new investigation, they're working on the premise that it's a recovery mission. You know, they're long since kind of put paid to any possibility that William might be being held by a pedo ring. So they've dismissed that. I just hope they find him and they're able to lay him to rest. Give him the, the funeral, the respect that he deserves. That's my hope for this case now. And one further twist is that the foster parents, foster mum and foster dad, have now been charged with common assault of another child in their care. So whether that relates to William or not, we've no idea. It's just interesting that these foster parents are now being investigated and their lives are being picked apart. But is this going to be another bark up the wrong tree? Just because the foster parents have now been charged with common assault of another child does not necessarily mean that they did anything to William. Was this a tragic accident that they covered up? It remains to be seen, but I have hopes. I, I do have hopes now that this investigation will be solved. I hope so anyway, fingers crossed. For William, for little Spider-Man, for the little Tiger Man, rah! But let me know what you think in the comments below. I've been Michelle, I hope you're well. I'll see you very soon in the next video. Check out my main channel, Michelle After Dark, if the YouTube algorithm has, has brought you here. Um, I do have another channel. So please check that out. Miss Tillington has a channel and Miss Cassie Springer also has a channel. So check out all of our channels and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.